So I suppose my story began um, actually before I was in high school, back when I was 13. And when I was 13, I came home one day to some really bad news. A close family friend who's like an uncle to me had actually passed from pancreatic cancer. And when the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers and using my best friend for information, Google Wikipedia, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer. But what I had found really shocked me. You see, 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And as I dug deeper, I'm like, why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancers? And that's when I stumbled across an even more shocking statistic. The current test for pancreatic cancer is the 60-year-old technique. I mean, first off, that's older than my dad, but also, and most likely my computer science teacher. But also, um, the thing is, is that it costs $800 per test. And then also, it misses 30% of all pancreatic cancers. And so your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. But oftentimes, you don't, these cancers, they don't show any symptoms. And so it's too far along before you can detect it. And I was sitting there, I'm like, well, this test, my kind of rationale is like, this test is so crappy that anything I do will probably be at least marginally better. <laughs> and so I set out armed with eighth grade biology to change the face of cancer diagnostics, a bit lofty of a goal, but I was going to do it. <laughs> and then I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would have to look like in order to be effective. It would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And I was sitting here looking at these criteria. I'm like, OK, this is easy enough. I could probably sort this out. I wasn't exactly sure how. And they found why we haven't updated our sensor in over six decades. And that's because when you're looking at these cancers, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly if there's variations in protein levels. And while this sounds very straightforward, it's anything but. You see, you have liters and liters of blood, which is already abundant in an innumerable amount of proteins. And you're looking for this one change in this one tiny amount of one protein. So it's like trying to find a needle in a sack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred due to my teenage optimism, or how people, some people label it, complete and utter ignorance of the entire field of pancreatic cancer research, I went on and I went and found a database of over 8,000 proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these cancers. And it was my summer break. I was pretty antisocial at the time, and I sat down, I locked myself in my room, and bashed out all 8,000 proteins, researching each and every one. And at the end of the summer, I was really doubting my potential for any like, future social interaction. And it did make for some very interesting back to school essays. My teacher was like, oh, to my friend, what did you do? And he was like, I went to Yellowstone. And then to Jack, to me, um, they were like, so what did you do? And I was like, oh, I researched proteins. <laughs> After that, there was this very awkward pause. And uh, I, was, I never sh shook the uh, nickname Protein Kid after that. <laughs> However, on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sanity, I finally found one protein that could work. And the name of this protein was called mesothelin. And it's just your ordinary run-of-the-mill type protein, unless, of course, you have pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer. In which case, it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease. When someone has close to 100% chance of survival, so if you could detect this protein, you could potentially detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. However, now the big question was, how on earth am I going to be able to detect this protein? I mean, here I am, Joe Schmo, 14 years old. What am I going to do? And my actual, like, I had this epiphany moment, and it came in a very unlikely place. High school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. Particularly with my biology teacher, we just did not get along. So one day, the conflict and tensions had risen to all-time highs. 
and I rebelled how any teenager would, I stuck in an article on single-walled carbon nanotubes. And a carbon nanotube, these are actually pretty much the coolest things ever. You see, there are these long, thin tubes of carbon that's an atom thick, and they're 150,000th the diameter of a single strand of your hair. So they're extremely small, but they have these amazing properties, kind of like the superheroes of material science. So I was sitting here, kind of feeling really James Bond-esque. I snuck it uh, between the pages of my biology textbook and was covertly sneaking glances at it while I was supposed to be paying attention to this lecture. And my biology teacher was kind of droning us to sleep about these things called antibodies. And antibodies are actually these very cool class of molecules. They will only react to one specific protein, kind of like a lock and key. And in this case, that protein was that cancer biomarker. And I was sitting there reading my article when all of a sudden it hit me. You could combine these two concepts. You see, if you take these antibodies and weave them into this network of nanotubes, then you'd have a network that would only react to one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these carbon nanotubes, it would actually change how electricity, how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present. And thus, you could detect pancreatic cancer using just a $50 ohm meter that you snagged from your dad's garage. And actually, he didn't know I had stolen it until like several months after. And he was like, oh, that's where it went. And I was never allowed in the garage again. <laughs> However, I was sitting there and I was like, wait, these networks of nanotubes, they're really flimsy. They're kind of like a bunch of, you can, it kind of looks like a bunch of soot when you have just like a bag of carbon nanotubes. And since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So I was like thinking, what's cheap? What could support these? And what can I get? Because I'm only a high school student at this point. I can't get like these super rare materials. And all of a sudden it hit me, I could use paper. And making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. If I ever do bad on a test, then you'd better watch out for the chocolate chip cookies or ice cream, depending on how bad I did. However, all you do is you take some water, you pour in the nanotubes, add the antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry, and then you can check cancer. And just as soon as I had this realization, I look up and I see my biology teacher kind of storming up to me, all red in the face. I swear she has eyes on the back of her head. Somehow she had found out or sensed that I had this paper and snatched it out of my hands. I was like, what is this actual science doing in my classroom? At least that's what I thought she said. She probably said something more along the lines of, do your class or else I'll fail you. However, after class, I was finally able to get the article back after listening to this giant talk about how I have to respect myself and others and all this other crap. I was like, just give me my article back. So I finally got it, and I was able to do more research on it. And then I was like, I'm probably going to need a lab to do this research. You can't exactly do cancer research on your kitchen countertop. Me and my brother had done some pretty crazy stuff, I must admit. We, for example, made these giant electrical towers in our basement that knocked out the entire um, power for our development, as well as giving ourselves some pretty bad electric shocks. My brother has several burns all over his body from that. Also, um, I cultured E. coli and cholera where we make our sandwiches every day. <laughs> Luckily, the CDC did not have to be called in for that. And we have landed ourselves on the FBI watch list for some of our other activities, especially our online purchasing activity, and that has landed my mom actually on the FBI watch list since we used her credit card. <laughs> she wasn't too pleased when the FBI showed up to search our house. However, I was like, I'm probably in the lab, cancer research isn't exactly in the family budget, so I then was like, okay, well, where's, what's some nearby university? And I was like, ah, Johns Hopkins and the National Institutes of Health. So I type up this giant manifesto, 30 pages long, that outlined every aspect of my procedure. And I sent it out to 200 professors at Johns Hopkins and the National Institutes of Health. And I was like, just let me work in your lab. Then I sat back, waiting for all these positive emails to pour in for me to be like, hey, all this wonder boy saves the world on the cover of Time magazine. However, then reality struck. And I got 199 rejections. 
and uh, I realized some professors aren't nearly as nice as those glowing profile pictures make them seem. <laughs> some can actually be very mean, and instead of doing normal like hobbies like crocheting or playing golf, they insult 16-year-old scientific procedures. <laughs> very meanly going through each and every line saying why it's the worst possible mistake I could make. However, undeterred, I kept going and after this kind of deluge of massive like negativity towards my project, I was like, well crap, maybe it doesn't work. I mean, I got told no by my parents. I was like, Psh, whatever, they don't know anything. And then I got told no by my biology teacher, but I hated her, so I didn't care. But then the 199 professors told me no, and I'm like, oh, maybe this isn't as cool as I thought it was. However, then finally, one positive email from Dr. Anderbaum Maicha at Johns Hopkins University came in, and he was like, all right, kid, maybe you can come in for an interview. So this, of course, to me meant, yes, uh, like a glowing review of my work. <laughs> However, I go in for this big interview clad in my normal attire of sweatpants and a hoodie, pretty professional, and I went in and I expected like normal interview questions like, oh, what's your favorite color? What do you want to be when you grow up? And no, this guy unfortunately knew his stuff. I couldn't bamboozle him like my parents. With my parents, I could just be like, oh, carbon nanotubes, cancer, chemistry, and they'd be like, okay, that sounds cool. <laughs> With this guy, he literally took 30 PhD students and stuffed them in this three meter by three meter room with me, and they kind of tried to sink my entire scientific procedure. And I kind of stumbled out of this interview, which was really an interrogation, but I luckily had landed the lab states I needed. I didn't know the answers to many of their questions. However, I guessed C like I did on my SATs. I figured oh, my SATs worked out pretty well. This will probably work. However, I got through and I got the lab states I needed. And just as soon as I started, I realized how little I knew. I had no clue what I was doing in that lab. On the first day, it was like, Jack, culture some cancer cells for us. And all you literally do to do this is you take a vial and you transfer the water or the cell liquid from that into another vial. I ended up sneezing in the second vial. I was like, cancer cells, they're pretty hard to kill. I mean, like they have an immune system or something. No, the next day there are like tentacles growing out of that flask. And I just kind of hid it away and denied the existence of it. And then over the course of the next seven months, I screwed up every imaginable scientific procedure. Like I trip and break my cell culture, burn them in the incubator, or I even blew them up in the centrifuge, which was a very great, like really awesome, like fountain of cell media going across the lab. And I thought it was totally worth it. My lab mentor at this point was like, why on earth did I ever accept this kid into my lab? However, after many nights of sleeping over at the lab and screwing up all of those procedures, I finally ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times as expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our conventional methods of cancer detection. But also, the coolest thing is, is that I can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when something that's close to 100% chance of survival. And so far, it is over 90% accuracy at detecting the cancer. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%. And it would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. You see, you can simply switch out that antibody and detect an entirely different protein, meaning an entirely different disease, ranging from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. The possibilities are literally endless. However, on this journey, I faced a lot of adversity. I mean, I got told no by my mom, my dad, my biology teacher, and 199 professors. Fortunately, they didn't tell me to make a paper mache volcano for my science rep project. However, the greatest difficulty that I faced on this entire journey was not being discounted by people, it was rather being discounted by the scientific community as a whole. You see, there are these things called scientific paywalls. And this means when you want to access information, you have to cough up $35 per article. And 
for young kids like me, this means that we can't do research at all because we simply don't have access to the information. We're kind of discounted by all of the researchers out there as little kids who couldn't possibly do actual science. And by having these $35 uh, research barriers, we've essentially created this very general disconnect between the general public and youth and science where we see all these big STEM initiatives that say we need more kids interested in science, STEM is a good thing, but then a Katy Perry single costs 99 cents and a seminal science article costs $35, that's a bit of a mixed message. And this isn't just a problem for 15-year-old cancer researchers, this is a problem for everyone. You see, recently, Harvard University released a statement to its faculty and students proclaiming that major periodical subscriptions, especially to electronic journals published by historically key providers, cannot be sustained. Continuing these subscriptions on their, current on their current footing is financially untenable. Now, what does it say about the world of academic publishing, flow of information, and accessibility of knowledge when Harvard University, the richest academic institution in the world, can't afford to continue paying for its subscriptions? By instituting these paywalls, we've created this very rigid class hierarchy in terms of knowledge. At the top, we have these elite, not, these elite institutions and corporate laboratories that can afford these multi-thousand dollar subscriptions, sometimes up to $40,000 per year per subscription. And even here in these knowledge elite, we have this kind of segregation where at the top we have the knowledge billionaires, those uh, big institutions like Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Stanford, that can afford these giant publications and pretty much any publication. But then lower down, we have kind of state-run institutions that don't have as large of endowments and can't afford every single, um, bit of every single subscription. And so what we have here is we're segregating people's access to knowledge based on how much money they have. And this tier-based method of the dissemination of knowledge isn't very effective. It's like saying to the top 10 institutions out there, you all can teach calculus and above, but everyone else is relegated to only algebra. And then under these knowledge elite, we have people like us, the knowledge middle class. We can access a few bit of the few uh, open access articles that are freely available to the public, as well as maybe shell out a few dollars here and there. But then we have the knowledge underclass. And this is 85% of the world's population, 5.5 billion people who lack access to the internet and live in knowledge poverty. So essentially what we're living in is a knowledge aristocracy, where only 0.008% of the world's population, that's it. That's like taking 80 people off the streets of London and saying you guys are the only people who can access uh, the scientific information, everyone else, too bad for you. And while 85% of the world's population is living in knowledge poverty, but imagine if we could live in a knowledge democracy, where what you look like, age or gender, doesn't apply, whether you're from Cambodia to China, from Malaysia to Mexico, whether you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day, you'd have the exact same access to information. Because knowledge should not be a commodity and science shouldn't be a luxury. Knowledge should be a basic human right. Because the minds of people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone not the minds of a select few who can't afford these articles. Because a girl in Pakistan should have just the exact same access to these scientific articles as preeminent Nobel laureate at Harvard. Not because it's economically sound, but rather because it's, um, because it's ethically correct, and that's what we call equality. And I think that we can institute this change, because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't quite know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we all can do together. Thank you.